So is it time for the Safe Third Country Agreement to be renegotiated? With me now, John Manley, who was Deputy Prime Minister at the time the agreement was signed back in 2002. Hi, Mr. Manley. Good to have you on our program. Thanks for making the time. Thanks, Bashi. Uh, before we get to, you know, the current issues facing the Safe Third Country Agreement and, and the Roxham Road portion of the Canada-U.S. border, I wanted to get your perspective as someone who signed that agreement about what was at the heart of it? What was the motivation really to create the agreement in a post-9-11 world? Well, this, you're right, it was post-9-11. It was part of what we call the Smart Border Accord that uh, I was in a position to negotiate with a very skilled team of bureaucrats with the United States, which was led at the time by, uh, their team was led by Governor Tom Ridge, later the first uh, U.S. Sec uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. We, the Safe Third Agreement was something that we were asking for. And we and that the U.S. was actually reluctant to give. Uh, we asked for it because we were facing um, a, quite a large inflow of refugee claimants. So, was there discussion at the time about what is now referred to as a loophole in the agreement? The fact that if people are coming from the states to seek asylum, they're turned back to the states. If it's at an official point of entry, however, in between those points. Um, it, it doesn't apply. Was was that part of the discussion or, or envisioned in any way? No, because those the, the notion that people would come en masse through illegal points of entry uh, seemed unlikely at the time. Um, it, it just wasn't hmm. it wasn't it wasn't a factor. We didn't really expect it to become one, and, and indeed it didn't become one for quite a long time. Uh, but I think many of the reactions to the to people coming in without having followed the process are the same. Whether they come in illegally, um, you know, at a at a rural site, or whether they come to the border and claim refugee status, I think uh, the problem the problem is that uh, Canadians are very welcoming and accepting of refugees. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The recent Events with Ukraine have demonstrated that. The welcoming of Syrians demonstrated that. But Canadians believe that people are abusing their uh, their generosity, that they're jumping the queue somehow. Uh, then that sympathy and that support for being open and welcoming to refugees will will wane. And um, and it's the same whether they're they're crossing you know, as they are now on an illegal site or whether they were crossing at a legal site. You mentioned the reluctance initially of the United States in, in those negotiations. We now know from the federal government that they have been uh, engaging in, as they characterize it, negotiations with the United States for a while now to try and, quote unquote, modernize the agreement. Do you think there is a way to amend the agreement or, or see it evolve so that it does address the issues, uh, for example, of what's happening uh, at Roxham Road? Uh, well, that's really a question for the Americans. I can tell you that this was a very difficult agreement to achieve. Um, Tom Ridge went to bat for us for this, uh, this particular agreement. It was something that he had to get approved by the U.S. Attorney General. They didn't want to do it. Uh, there were things, of course, that we gave in exchange for it. I can't remember now what items there were in that 22-point smart border accord that were of particular interest to them, uh, probably some harmonization of visa rules. Um, but um, I think there will be a lot of reluctance on the part of uh, U.S. authorities to uh, give this to Canada without something in return, and I don't know what there might be that we could give in return. So when you look at the issue as it stands, um you know that the political debate is either have it apply to the whole border or suspend it or scrap it. Do you think the agreement is still applicable, should still be relevant, is still relevant, or, or do you think there needs to be a kind of a wholesale look at the system as it exists right now? I, I think there's a, there's a separate issue there, which is um, Canada's ability to control its own borders. Now, I know it's simplistic to say, why don't you just block Roxham Road? And the, and, and the government's right to say, well, if we do that, they'll just come in somewhere else. Possibly true, uh, but fundamental to the nation's sovereignty 
is the ability to control our borders. So I think when there is abuse of the border, then it's the government's responsibility to try to figure out a way to stop that. For us to suspend the agreement would simply be to open up the, uh, the flow uh, that we had uh, leading up to 2003, which was coming in uh, through legal means. It's a lot safer, first of all, a lot easier, uh, but uh, doesn't solve the problem for us. There is no shortage of refugees in the world. Uh, the world is awash in refugees. I've been in the biggest refugee camp in the world, in Dadaab in northern Kenya, and it breaks your heart. And Canada should be welcoming and receiving many of those refugees. It's our responsibility as a wealthy country. But we should choose them, and they should come in in a manner in which we uh, provide for their support. The federal government has some responsibility because of its control of the borders to do that. We shouldn't be leaving cities and provinces stranded because of an uncontrolled uh, flow of people coming in claiming to be refugees. Okay, Mr. Manley, I'm going to leave it there. I'm out of time. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Fashi.